Welcome to Order Militaris Radio TV, and we're lifelong Catholics, and what we do is all for free, and for the love of Jesus Christ, and for Holy Mother, the Church, and we'll defend our Holy Mother, the Church. Today we're going to be talking about something that no one's talking about, that we don't hear about, that is about how the U.S. Latin Rite Catholic bishops drove hun- hundreds of thousands of Eastern Catholics to the Orthodox, and also how they destroyed ethnic parishes. Welcome, Brother Alexis. Uh, thank you, AJ, for having me on Auto Militaris Radio TV. Uh, you're a unique Catholic pastor. We talk about uh, many things in the light of Christ and topics about the church history that you are never been told by your local priest. And you yeah. weren't taught in CCD school, and you won't hear anywhere, especially on controlled media, where they just want fabs and clicks and fame, and they just want to be friends of everyone and attend those cocktail parties, but they don't actually want to inform you about what's going on. And this is a topic I'm glad you covered because it's very dear to me as an Italian American because we are heavily persecuted by the Irish clergy in the United States, and no one has ever talked about this as one of the dark secrets. And it's not just Italians. It's all kinds of ethnic groups, and today we're going to talk about one of the greatest scandals of all, uh, 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 the persecution of Ruthenian right Catholics. So, uh, AJ, I'll let you begin, but first, tell everyone what is a Ruthenian Catholic or a Greek Catholic? They are of the Byzantine right, or the are of the Constantinople, Constantinople right? Where they they do everything in Greek or or if they're in Ukraine or other parts of East Eastern Europe, they use Old Church Slavonic. Mm-hmm. So all the Ukrainian Catholics do Slavonic, and Ukrainian Catholics in the United States are often called Ruthenian Catholics, although the Ruthenian uh, Catholics also include Greek Rite or which called Slavonic Rite Catholics in. Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Poland. They mm-hmm. have it. So, um, what this, is it? Yeah. Um, so it de- deals with Father Alexis Georgievic Toth. He was born March 14th in 1853 in Kobdinsk, near Preslov. In the country of Slovakia, then part of the Austrian Empire, during the reign of Franz Joseph. Okay, so this is a perfectly Catholic man. He grew up and he he became a Catholic priest. Where did he study? Okay, so he completed his primary schooling and attended the Roman Catholic Seminary for one year, followed by three years in a Greek Catholic Seminary, an additional time at the University of Prague. We graduated with a degree in theology. Okay, so uh, did he be- begin his priestly ministry in, in Europe and then come to the States? Yeah, he did it in Slovakia, where he was ordained also by, I think, his uh, uncle, Bishop Nicholas Toth, uh, Bishop of Prez- Prezlov, and back in Eastern Catholics, and can be married one there as well, so... And then his wife and his child dies, and then he becomes the diocesan chancellor in the local um, uh, parish is there. And he also was a professor and director at the Greek Catholic Seminary in Preslov in 1889. And so then in 18, then also in 1889, Father Alexis Bishop received a petition from the Ruthenian Catholic Church in the United States, asking that Toth be sent to them as a priest. He arrived on November 15, 1889, and by the 27th of that month was holding services at the St. Mary's Greek Catholic Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He found the church barely furnished and deeply in debt. He set about rectifying the situation and ultimately bringing the parish to a place of physical stability while never taking a salary. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about uh, Father Alexander Toth, who's considered a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church today. 
And you can see he went through a lot of suffering. He was highly respected in the Ruthenian uh, diocese where he served in Europe. And uh, this invitation to bring him to the United States, I don't know anything specific about it, but I can guess the reason for, because the Latin Rite bishops or the Roman Catholic bishops in the United States, they didn't want Eastern Rite clergy in the United States who were married clergy because they felt that the laity would be confused. Actually, what they feared is that seminarians would join the Eastern Rites, uh, get married, and then become priests, and then they wouldn't have seminarians. So this is a fight between two different mentalities, and it might have had something to do with homosexual clergy and heterosexual clergy factions. I'm not saying that's the case, but it's highly likely. So Father Toth's career is spotless from this point of on. Mm -hmm. Then he makes a mistake. He goes and visits to the Archbishop of Minneapolis. And why? Should, he didn't have to. He's not of the Roman right, but it's a courtesy call. And this is where everything starts going wrong for Father Toth. Yeah. He goes and meets with John, Archbishop John Ireland, who had begun with uh, Archbishop Gibbons of Baltimore to begin Americanizing German and other Catholic immigrants. And he was hostile to ethnic parishes, such as the one Toth served. Now, we already, we already covered that uh, Bishop Ireland was most likely a Freemason and pushing the whole idea of melting pot ideology. We'll get more into that. But let's just recount the events as they happen now with Father so, Toth. When speaking of the meeting, Toth later claimed that Ireland became angry and threw Toth's priestly credentials on to his table where, while ardently protesting his presence in the city. Toth reported that Ireland said he did not consider Toth or his bishop to be truly Catholic. In clear contradiction of the union of used hoarded um, um, and papal decrees to the contrary. Toth reported that the conversation became more heated as it progressed, with both men losing their tempers. Ireland refused to give Toth permission to serve as a priest in Minneapolis, and furthermore ordered his parishes and priests not to have anything to do with Ruthenian Catholic priests or his parish or, or his parishioners. Although Toth sent letters to his bishop in Hungary detailing his experience and requesting specific instructions, he never received a reply. Okay, so his not receiving a reply is strange. It could be that Erlen had friends in the post office and they stole the letters. And that has happened before. I, I know cases where um, bishops in Italy mail letters through the post office and they don't get a stamp when they're supposed to get a stamp. So um, if Father Toth had the instruction from his bishop, he would know how to respond, but basically he's cut off. Now, a lot of this has to do with the fact that the American Roman Rite bishops did not want Eastern Rite dioceses overlapping their territories because they were control freaks. Um, but I think the, the, the response is more Masonic. The Irish mm -hmm. are very xenophobic in a bad way. It means they don't like outsiders. And uh, the Irish clergy have destroyed the church in the United States. We'll get into that and why that's the case. Uh, so Father Toff's in a really bad situation. He's been calumniated, blacklisted, and he and his faithful are being attacked by the Catholic clergy that's supposed to be part of the church. This is an act of schism on the part of Archbishop Ireland and his, his clergy who collaborated with him in this, committing the sin of schism. So having heard nothing from his own bishop, he and other Eastern Rite Catholic priests who had shared similar experiences began to cast about for a solution to their dilemma. In December 1890, they contacted the Russian consul in San Francisco, California, asking to put in touch with the Russian Orthodox Bishop. Correspondence and personal meetings with Bishop Vladimir Zorozovsky of San Francisco followed, culminating in Toss' decision to formally enter the Russian Orthodox Church in March in 1892. Toth was accompanied by 361 fellow Eastern Rite Catholics. Thousands more would follow in the years to come. Following his conversion to Orthodoxy, Toth tirelessly preached his new faith to other Eastern Rite Catholics in North America, 
This combined with further demands by the U.S. Latin bishops against East Rite parishes facilitated the conversion of over 20,000 East Rite Catholics to Russian Orthodoxy by the time Toth died in 1909. The Orthodox Church in America had claimed that by 1916, and Ireland is still alive for two more years, the Latin Catholic Church had lost 163 East Rite parishes with over 100,000 faithful to the Russian missionary diocese. Now, if the church was operating correctly, uh, Benedict XV should have excommunicated Archbishop Ireland for this schism. Never mm -hmm. was. He should have been condemned and anathematized. Never was. Uh, these clergy, someone should have reached out to these clergy to bring them back. Never to happen, at least as far as we know. And uh, you can see, though, that there's a slight difficulty. So he joins the Russian Orthodox Church, but they end up, all these parishes end up part of the Orthodox Church in America. And it, this is a misnomer because the Orthodox Church in the, um, America, and until only recently, wasn't even recognized by the Greek Patriarch in Constantinople. It, it was considered an uncanonical church, a kind of like an amalgam of all the Eastern rites operating under their own thing. But they had bishops and they had the sacraments. And um, we Latins might think it's a bit extreme that Father Toff goes to a Russian Orthodox bishop, but in, in the proper notion of the church, every priest has to be under a bishop and the faithful need a bishop. It's not like the faithful, if they're deprived of a bishop, have to stay deprived of a bishop. That It doesn't work that way, even though a lot of abuse, ecclesiastic abuse in the West has required the faithful to live that way under the Latin rite, and that's just not right. So um, we can't approve of the fact that he joined a schismatic church, but we can understand the uh, the uh, what was going on here is a lot more than just a disagreement with Father Toth. You don't get 167 parishes to leave unless there's a lot of bitter attacks going on all across the na nation from thousands of clergy against thousands of clergy. And um, I come from an immigrant family more recent than yourself, AJ, because we're all us Europeans are immigrants here. But um, I can understand that um, ethnic prejudice has dire effects here in New England. You know, I'm currently in Massachusetts. I know Italian families that changed their name, their surname. They couldn't get a job with the name with the name like in Zarello or or they had to change their name to some milk toast name uh, because the prejudice was so bad and it was not just coming from wasps that is white anglo-saxon protestants it was coming from irish catholics i know a case uh, uh the franciscan province of ohio split into three groups one was irish one was german one was italian the germans and italians first kicked out the germans and the irish first kicked out the italians and then the irish and german went after each other and this province split into three provinces so these rivalries went on and they shouldn't go on they shouldn't exist uh even in religious orders so um it's a terrible thing and uh here we see the failure of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, because this began under Leo the Thirteenth, and the failure of Benedict the Fifteenth to do something about it, because it, it consummated under Benedict the Fifteenth. Pius the Tenth, did he do anything about it? Doesn't seem that he stopped it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he might be a saint, but uh, this is he's not admirable in this, and probably no one told him what was going on. We'll assume that with Saint Pius the Tenth. Uh, but Toth, you might know, you might hear it through the word Toth. That's a Hungarian surname. And there's a lot of Toths in this country. Not all of them are the Greek right. Most of them are of the Roman right. But if you're hung, if you're a listener and you have Hungarian descent, you might know something of this story of uh, Father Alexis Toth. Um, and, um, right now, there is only 15 dioceses or eparchies in the United States, and maybe. I know there is only one men's monastery in Wisconsin and at least two women monasteries. Here we have to praise Pope Benedict, the, the Pope Benedict, I think it was, who allowed the Eastern Rite Diocese in the United States to have married clergy. Uh, I know a, a Latin Rite who joined the uh, 
Maronite right in Lebanon, he's been persecuted his whole life in the United States because they never recognized that he could, you know, found a monastery, even though he had permission from his bishop in Lebanon to do so. So it, it, it's outrageous. Mm. It's uncanonical. It's illegal. It's criminal. And it's contrary to charity. It's schismatic also. Yeah. Um, this is a big failure of the apostolic see, the Roman pontiffs, so the last century in the United States, they should have taken action. Because now you hear all, I mean, what if, what do the Irish bishops today are pushing? They're all Democrats. Mm-hmm. And they're all pushing acceptance, welcoming different ethnicities. Wait, you just spent a century persecuting mm-hmm. ethnic. And, uh, 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 you know, what hypocrisy. Yeah. And you go to some of these by- parishes or dioceses, or you watch them on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, they've lost their, their chance. It's all Americanized now. Yeah. And that's not only that, the ethnic parishes. So there's some really beautiful churches in Kansas. When I was visiting mm-hmm. you in the spring, uh, I saw a few. They're built by German Catholics. And evidently, the Irish bishops kind of let you guys off. <laughs> no. mm-hmm. Because I guess they felt Germans and Irish were the same race or something. Uh, the Germans built the churches so well, you really couldn't tear them down. Whereas other Im- immigrants were poor, like the Poles or the Italians. They're usually built tiny little churches. And the Irish wanted big churches that could throw a lot of laity and stuff. So... Um, uh, the, but the persecution just didn't end with Ireland, didn't end with the Ruthenians. It went on against Italian Catholics, Polish Catholics, uh, French Catholics. Uh, all these ethnicities used to have their own ethnic parishes in, in eastern cities. May have not existed out west, but in eastern cities. And it was terrible, and it was relentless. It was a persecution won on for 80 years, and then most of these parishes don't exist anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's like what you say. What did you say before the show? How they sold them, tear them down, and I'll give you. I'll give you some case examples. So my family is from St. Michael's Italian Catholic Church in Atlantic City, a beautiful little church, probably can hold two hundred people at most, not even. Absolutely stunning statuary imported from Italy. Stained glass window imported from Italy. It was the Italian parish in Atlantic City. And just down the street is the Irish parish, which is steeple and kind of English style looking. So um, um, first they restrict, first they allowed, there was Italian. The mass was in Italian, the songs were in Italian when the mass was in Latin. Then when Vatican II came along and you could do the vernacular, masses were in Italian and there was an Italian speaking priests there. Then they took away the Italian speaking priests and they sent an Italian American who couldn't speak Italian. And then they got rid of the Italian masses. And and then they slowly like closed down the school, put pressure on it. And so now it's part of the Irish parish. And um, um, it was very, very subtle. And uh, the whole neighborhood ran down afterwards. Most of the times did emigrate out because they weren't getting support. So uh, that's one example. Another example, is, uh, Holy Trinity German Church, Boston. And I know this because they used to have the Latin Mass. They used to go there in the 90s. It was a thriving German Catholic community in Boston. That whole section was called, you know, Little Germany. They had uh, a huge church that could seat maybe 800. Built beautifully, a beautiful stone, absolutely stunning stained glass because the German stained glass industry was the best at the beginning of the 20th century. They knew how to do all the colors and they remained brilliant because they were such expert in chemists. Beautiful wooden Gothic altars. So the altar, high altar in wood would have all these like Gothic spires and saints and angels, absolutely beautiful triple side altars and um, um, beautiful wooden um, pews in the whole church. And um, they had a school, they had even a cinema, and they had a whole German Catholic community uh, with shops, butcher shops, restaurants, and all kinds of things that were German. 
so important is this German Catholic community to American history? You don't know it. I'll tell you the story. This is the Catholic parish that invented the Christmas card. You send Christmas cards to everyone? That began at Holy Trinity German Catholic Church in Boston. And it spread to all America, Catholic and non-Catholic. I mean, the greeting card companies wouldn't exist without this parish. Another thing for this parish. This parish introduced the Christmas tree to the United States. No one used a Christmas tree in the United States. No kind of Christian used a Christmas tree in the United States until the Catholics at Holy Trinity Church started putting up Christmas trees because it was a German tradition that goes back to even before the Reformation. It has nothing to do with paganism, okay? Uh, and um, this is the parish that started that. But the bishops of Boston have always been Irishmen until first non-Irishman was a Portuguese and he was like in the 70s. They've always been Irishmen. So they had a long plan to destroy this church. And um, they sold off the school. They sold off the property of the parish. They made it impossible for it to provide services to the German Catholics. They sold it to other ethnicities. What's the ethnicity that's taken control of the neighborhood? Chinese, pagan Chinese. So, you know. And then eventually, um, they said it wasn't financially capable of being survived. It needed to be shut down, but they put the Latin, traditional Latin mass in there. And they got all these tradies from all over New England to come there to say mass. And they gave, they said, if you give generously, we'll keep the church open. All that money was stolen. And um, the parishioners found out it was stolen because I urged them to do an audit of the parish. And when they found out that O'Malley had allowed the money to be stolen, O'Malley waited three or four years and then he shut down the parish and sold that church. Church is now an apartment building. It still looks like a church, but when you go inside, there's apartments. And who and that's the gay part of town now. So who knows what things are going on in that church? And that's Bishop O'Malley, Irishman. I have a good Irish friend that says, O'Malley, that clan is a bunch of criminals. They should never have made anyone a bishop from that clan. That's what an Irishman in Ireland tells me. Um, Gardner, Massachusetts, just down the road for where I'm speaking to you now. There was absolutely stunning, beautiful Polish Catholic church in town. And in the 70s, the Irish Bishop of Worcester closed it down against the will of the people. Half the congregation left the Catholic church. They don't practice the faith anymore. They lost their faith because the bishop stole their church and took the sacraments away from them. And what do they do with these ethnic parishes? They steal the statuary. They steal the marble. They steal the altar rails. They steal the glass windows. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, in one diocese, Diocese of Fall River, I know this is a fact because I was in a church where this happened. <clears throat> they were taking out the remains of the beautiful organ that had like hundreds of pipes. And the company that was taking it out was there. And the company told me this. So this guy was an expert. He had worked in New England for 40 years on organs. And he says, you know, I do what I'm paid to do, but I don't like it because in the last 20 years, this is what he told me in the 90s. In the last 20 years, the bishops did this. They didn't like an ethnic parish. They'd say, well, you can't. So they'd first tell the congregation, well, your organ doesn't work. So this is a sign we need to close your parish down. Oh, no, we'll raise money to fix the organ. So they raise money to fix the organ. They would bring in this company over the weekend. And the bishop would tell this company take a chainsaw and cut the organ to pieces. And they would take a chainsaw and destroy an organ worth 200, 400, 800 million dollars, destroy it. And then they would take out the pieces and then we'd tell the congregation, it was too badly damaged, we couldn't repair it. And the bishops would sell the pipes for the value of gold and silver. And then they say, well, you don't have an organ, you can't do your music anymore. The people would start with going away. They'd close the church and they'd sell it, usually to a Protestant congregation, Irish bishops. Mm -hmm. And these are the crimes that no one talks about. So we're just a week or so away from Bishop Strickland being sacked in Tyler. That's a tiny little thing.
compared to the crimes of the Irish bishops in the United States, for which the Vatican has never intervened to defend us. Now, I'm not talking about we should promote schism to the bishops of Rome. That's not the point here. The point is, if we don't fight for our rights, don't expect Rome to come and help you. If you're not fighting to keep Strickland and Tyler, then there's no one who's going to fight for it. It's not going to happen any other way. And um, uh, don't think that because your bishop is your bishop, you have to obey him or that he can't be a criminal. He can. Can. We won't even talk about Bishop O'Malley sh shutting down parishes in Boston Diocese. He just he drove a third of the uh, Catholics out of the church because he would only sell the churches to non-Catholics or homosexuals. He'd never sell them to Catholics because he was a fear that someone would turn it into a chapel and compete with him. So mm -hmm. that that's one of the sad tragedies in the Catholic Church in the United States, and it goes on elsewhere. Uh, Benedict the 15th approved the Bishop of Berlin to sell half the churches in the city of Berlin, Germany. And I don't see how you could be forgiven by God for that. Mm -hmm. That's against the uh, second council of Nicaea, which anathematizes bishops who sell churches. Mm -hmm. So if any of you, if any of the viewers out there uh, from Rome or over at Ordo Militaris on YouTube or whatever, if you're uh, have the last name Toth and maybe related or know something of more about what happened to Father Toth in the fight with Archbishop John Ireland, please let us know. Yeah, and if you used to go or your family used to go to an ethnic parish in the United States and you have a similar story to share, go in the comments and write out your whole narrative and document it. And uh, maybe we'll read them all. In a, in a second show, because this is something we should talk about. We have the right to have beautiful churches. We have the right, whatever our ethnicity is, to express our Catholic faith in, within our ethnic culture. There's nothing evil about that. Why is it you have to be welcoming to all these people out Latin America, and yet you spend a century attacking our ethnic parishes? Mm -hmm. This is Order Military Radio TV sending off. Day is full. Day is full.